This is episode 52. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Today is the second half of my interview with the firm principals at Motative, a modern Los Angeles architecture firm. They launched their firm in 2006, and late last year I dropped in and visited their office, so this is actually the first time I have an on-location shoot. I encourage you to hop on over to my YouTube channel or the Business of Architecture show page on businessofarchitecture.com and check out the incredible high-definition video we got on there. There's also a little tour of Motative's office that they moved into last year that you might want to check out. So in this interview, I get the inside story on how they built a successful modern architecture practice that continues to grow year after year. Here's the show. And then how many, how many of your leads now come from your web site and web presence? Still a, a bunch. Um, I would say most of them. I mean, we're starting to get to the point where there's some projects being built and so people know us that way or they've just heard about us tied to small lot subdivision. But I mean, there's still multiples per week that are just raw straight off, straight off the web. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I just, I guess one last question for each of you. Tell me about, I'd just like to know about your favorite project since you guys have been together. Um, I would say that uh, my favorite project so far actually isn't an architecture project. I would say that it's... Um, the community outreach we've found ourselves doing lately. I never thought we'd start a firm and sort of become sort of a lobbyist, um, but with doing small lot subdivision now, we've taken a proactive approach, including all the way down to our staff to going to local neighborhood councils, community councils, um, even in some regards other cities to talk about the benefits of small lot subdivision in general. And that's been almost a design project in itself, organizing that, trying to figure out how to change people's perspectives on things, um, get them to think about innovative housing. Um, and to me, that that has a greater impact than any, any one project can. Uh, for me, it's also, I, it's hard to pinpoint one project. I don't feel very, this is odd, I don't feel very sentimental about them when they're done. I feel like we kind of do our job and then hand them off to future home people that live in them. In our case, we don't know those people. They come and they buy it after it's built for the most part. But um, so for me, I think the, I always say like my most exciting project is the next project. So the next one that comes in the office. And I think I'm most excited about this idea, which we're starting to get to now. Um, we were explaining earlier how we've expanded a lot in the last year. I like coming in and starting to have an idea where our staff is managing the project and we're just kind of dabbling in it. Like we come in for design reviews, we're in the major meetings, but that's actually what excites me the most is that the projects are happening and we have our hands in them, but the less we have our hands in them and like our young staff is actually bringing the projects along. And I like to see the excitement that they have and like getting those opportunities to manage projects at a young age, uh, because I feel like I was given those opportunities too. And it's really nice to see. And that, so I'm almost most excited to see one of their projects that they're managing, make it all the way through and built. And just to see like that reaction that, that it, or what it brings to them or what it could fulfill in their life. Well, that's great. You guys are you know, really leaving a legacy. You know, I know my mentors did that for me too, and that's, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, awesome. Now, since we have you guys here, I also want to ask you, tell me about your design philosophy because we're not just talking about the business of architecture here. You guys have a very distinctive design philosophy. Yeah. Who would like to speak on that? Derek, you have I'm the tired. mic, man. Go ahead. I've been losing Give my us. voice the last few days, so oh, yeah. I'm trying to save it. Actually, it's better today than yesterday. Mm. Uh, that that's a really that's a, that's a really tough question. What to, what drives your to, design? You know, I think to Michael answer. touched on it a little bit. I think for us, what's what what people always send, tend to ask is, do you are you getting bored of this small lot subdivision mm. because you're very focused on this one project type? And to me, the answer is, is clearly no, because I think for us, the design philosophy comes from what do we and what do our friends and what does maybe even our generation want in LA? And that is a cool, relatively attainable place to live that doesn't cost you a lot where you can bike to work or walk to work or walk to a restaurant, walk to a bar and not have to sit on the freeway or live out in the boonies and commute in. So I think it's driven more to like a really personal level. And that's sort of how we got into this product type was what can we do 
um, from an architecture and now a construction side to better the city. And so it's less about style. It's less about those things. It's more about that kind of goal. And then for us, what I think what makes it interesting is even though they're mostly in city of LA, every neighborhood, which I didn't even know growing up, I lived on the West side, but every neighborhood is so unique in Los Angeles. And, um, like, you know, the other day, Christian and I drove out to a new job site and like, we, we've been on this major street with restaurants. I'm like, I've never been here in my life. And I lived in LA my entire life. And so I think the neighborhoods drive a lot for us, for us, like seeing the neighborhood and how can we sort of conform our modern aesthetic to that neighborhood. And then also every client brings like a new interesting challenge. What are their goals? What do they think is interesting? Um, so I think those sort of two things, the site context and then the client and their personalities and bringing those things together along with our desire to kind of really better the city, awesome. make it a good place. Awesome. You know, it would be great to look back in 10 years at this conversation yeah. and see where you guys are at. So tell me, where do you think you'll be in 10 years? And in 10 years, I'll send you an email, I'll give you a call. And we'll say, hey, man, let's, let's see where you guys are at. So tell me, where do you, where do you think you'll be in 10 years? Or where would you like to be? I'm a, hopefully like a beach in Cabo. And I just call I like in that. once a week. Or <laughs> so, you know, Friday. You know, something like that. So uh, uh, I don't know. I think, I think more of a, you know, we talked about this earlier, um, more of a total turnkey solution, I think, for, for getting projects like this built, um, whether that's through clients coming to us or sort of our next jump is developing them ourselves. And taking that to a new level. But um, I always like to say, like, in this office, I feel like there aren't a lot of egos. There's a collective ego, a motive ego, but I don't think there's a Christian, Derek, Michael ego in this office. So we don't care where the ideas come from um, as long as the whole group gets credit is what's most important. So as the firm grows, it doesn't really matter who, you know, who's designing it, what, who has what roles as long as I think there's a group success and a group accomplishment for the whole team. Yeah. I'd say the only thing I'd want to add to that is, um, you know, we have the great joy of creating this interesting housing all over Los Angeles. Um, and at the end of the day, one of the hardest things is always to turn that over to the developer, the new owner, and they get to move in and the staff moves on. I'd say, you know, for the most part, you know, 99% of our staff rents. Um, they never have the opportunity to live in what they design. And I think that's a lot for most people in this uh, design world, in this field of architecture. You rarely get to live in the product that you're designing for other people. So we have a sort of personal goal to figure out a way to get every one of our staff members in a project that they've designed or that they've developed on their own so that they can get the idea to, uh, of what it's like to experience it. So in 10 years, I'd like to look back and see that everybody's living in one of these themselves. Yeah, so. great. That's amazing. You know, one thing that I'm glad that you guys took the time to sit down with me and have this conversation is that there's a lot of other up-and-coming young architects like here within your office, but also obviously out there on the Internet who see you guys and what you guys are doing. So you guys have become, you know, and are becoming sort of a figurehead for them. You know, they look at you and, man, I wish I would really like to do what they're doing. So Christian, since you have the mic, what would you say to um, a young architect out there who wants to start his or her own firm? What, what one piece of advice would you give them to help them achieve that and get to where you guys are at? Um, I would say, you know, most people immerse themselves in the world of architecture as much as possible. Probably 100% of their time is in the world of architecture. I would say to take a, take a step back from that, um, get out of the world of architecture and understand what everybody else is doing in other types of business. I would say that most of um, what we've experienced and advice we've gotten to become successful hasn't been in the architecture world. It's been with other entrepreneurs that have started their own businesses and even failed. Um, you know, lawyers, other business people, MBAs. Um, number one, I would say go get go get an MBA. Instead of going to graduate school in architecture, go to get, get your master's in business from a good school. Everything is uh, in this world revolves around business, and if you don't have a good, strong core understanding of that, it's going to be hard for you to sell your great ideas and do the design work to the people that are ultimately paying for it, which are people that are really schooled in, in the world of business, not architecture. Yeah. Shameless plug for Business of Architecture, and if you want to find out more about business, <laughs> feel free to visit the Business of Architecture, uh, right? And in addition to getting an MBA, what other ways do you, would you, what other examples or concrete steps would you recommend that someone do or follow to get to, yeah. Yeah, you okay over there? Okay. Yeah, to, to, you know, to get the business experience, like you said, to get that business education. Um, and, I well, 
I'm sorry. But you also mentioned learning from other entrepreneurs. I'd like to dig into that just a little bit more and figure out you know, how, how they can. You know, I would say um, in the school level, you know, join clubs and school uh, networking groups that, that are outside of the architecture school itself, whether that means you're joining a, you know, a fraternity or a sorority or, um, you know, a business group. Uh, um, once you get out of school, it's a, it's a very similar process. I mean, whether you're dealing with, you know, um, the ULI, um, young, you know, real estate development groups, um, people, there's a lot of things out there outside of the world of architecture that people are doing. Networking is key. I mean, I don't think any of us would be in the situation we're in today if it wasn't for leveraging relationships that we had, you know, fresh out of school. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's key is just is building up that, that network because ultimately architects don't hire other architects to do work. It's other people out there. So you know, spreading that network and, and, and growing it is, is key. Okay. So you mentioned the Urban Land Institute, ULI. Is there a favorite networking niche or resource that you would just say, hey, you know, if you're really looking for something to do tomorrow, go step out and join this club or this organization? I think for us, the, the ULI was, was a big one. Um, it, it allowed us to meet other people that are tied into this field that aren't necessarily designers or architects yeah. or engineers. Okay. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it's anything that you – you're ultimately passionate about. Um, you could be, you know, really into sports. You could be really into, you know, whatever it is. There's some kind of group out there, and somewhere within those groups is going to want good design. And if you can latch onto those people and their opportunities, and sort of ride that wave, it's it's it can open up doors for you. Awesome. Any other words of advice for other young up and coming designers? Because hopefully they'll find this. And I I only say it because I was just on that topic what Christian was just saying, but. Um, I often tell people when I tell our kind of story of how we started that if you plan on starting an architecture firm, especially in like your late 20s, like we did, late 20s? Yeah, your late 20s. Um, the only people that are going to hire you are family and friends because nobody really trusts an architect that hasn't really doesn't have anything built under their name when they're in their late 20s. And so what Christian said is completely valid. So um, strangers aren't probably not going to hire you. They're not going to look at your website and come in and see a face with no wrinkles and no gray hair and say, I'm hiring that person. So um, finding those friends and those connections and finding people that trust you is important because when they're buying architecture, they're spending more money than they're going to spend on anything. It makes a car look like peanuts as a purchase. So you have to have an ultimate trust of people. And people don't, strangers don't tend to trust architects in their late 20s or even early to mid 30s. So you have to have that. Um, and for us, that was partially that and then partially focusing on something where we feel like we knew it as well as anyone else. And that was a small lot subdivision ordinance. Gentlemen, thank you for sitting down with us. And, you know, is, is there an opportunity for us to go around and, and meet the people in the office or maybe just get a tour of the office and see the people that make this machine run? Okay. Let's do it. a lot of to see. And that's a wrap. Thanks for riding along on another show about the business of architecture. I want to know your opinion about today's episode. Visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash podcast or send me an email at show at businessofarchitecture.com with your feedback about today's show. And remember, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free to grab your free membership pass to Business of Architecture Insider, where you'll have first access to free resources to help you run a great business. See you next week. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you run a great business. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, do it anyway.